Welcome back to Practical Game Design. I'm Ananda. I thought now might be a good time to get back into making videos about Godot, considering the recent Unity fiasco. I recently started work on a new Godot game, which makes me think that this is a great opportunity to try out a new format. So this is not a focused tutorial video. I'm not going to be explaining a single concept in detail. Instead, this is going to be more of a devlog. I'm working on this new game, Dungeonfall, and I just want to walk you through uh, recent things that I've added, problems I've run into, and generally my thought processes on working through some of these problems, which should hopefully help me to organize my thoughts, and I'm hoping it will also help you to get a better idea of just how you go about making games in Godot. I might make some focus tutorials later, um, but for now I think this may be a more sustainable format for me. So what you see here is the new game that I'm working on. I started it a few days ago, uh, I think two days ago. I'm calling it Dungeon Fall, although that might change in the future. The game, the core idea of the game is it's sort of like a Dungeon Keeper game, if you're familiar with, say, Dungeon Keeper 2, I think is the most famous one, but uh, using something more like pachinko uh, mechanics. You have a board of pegs, you have your dungeon, which is this deep pit, and there are heroes and monsters that you drop into the pit, and depending on where they land, different things will happen. So you can see there's this uh, priest character floating above the pit. And if I click, um, he falls down through the pegs. Right now it's pretty bare bones, but my plans are that there will be different rooms that you can place in your dungeon uh, that have different abilities. And certain monsters will be better in some rooms than others, so you might be trying to drop your monsters into specific rooms. And then, of course, you want to drop heroes into rooms that have uh, monsters that are good against those heroes, or maybe the room is unfavorable to the particular type of hero. Like, for example, this priest character, maybe he's really good against undead monsters, so you want to try to avoid dropping him into a room with undead monsters. Um, and then at the bottom of the pit will be the dungeon core, and uh, if it dies, you lose, of course. You can easily drop monsters uh, into the dungeon core to defend it, but it's also very easy for heroes to go there, so you have to be careful with that. I'm envisioning this as a sort of a roguelike game um, with sh relatively short runs and a lot of replayability. I would say my main inspirations for this game are Peglin and The Ratchet's Den, um, both of which I definitely recommend checking out, uh, especially The Ratchet's Den. So this should give you a basic idea of what the game's about. Uh, so I would like to show you some of the things that I've done recently on this, uh, starting with the game board. So you can see this is uh, what the game board looks like, and this is based on a tile set, which I made myself. So you can see here, these are the tiles. It's just a PNG image I made in uh, A-Sprite. Uh, you can see this is the whole set right here. And uh, one of the things about Godot 4 is it's made really big improvements on the Godot 3 tile set editor. You may notice that these tiles are offset. If we go and look at the scene here, um, this is my test scene. It's just sort of a demo where I've uh, built this room. You can see uh, here's the tile set, which I'm calling peg tiles. And you can set different tile shapes. So I've chosen half offset square, but of course you can do a classic square setup, or you can do isometric. Um, obviously these don't really work with the tile set that I've designed. Uh, or you can do a hex grid. So uh, lots of useful options here. In this case, the tiles are offset so that the pegs aren't just all arranged one underneath the other. Now, if we go and look at uh, how this tile set works, for those who aren't familiar with tile sets, there's a distinction between the tile set and the tile map. So tile map is the scene, so it's what we have in this window here. And the tile in the tile map, I've set a tile set, which is uh, right here, pegtiles.tres. So this is a resource. If we look in the resource, we can see uh, first of all, there's these six tiles. Then I go to, if I go to the select window, I can click on a tile and see different 
aspects uh, of the tile. So we've got the coordinates in the tile atlas. You can animate tiles. Uh, I'm not going to go into that too much right here. You can create terrains that let you auto tile regions. Um, you can set a probability so you can have uh, different tiles where as you're painting it randomly chooses a tile from a set. Um, and then the main thing that I had to set up here was the physics layer, uh, specifically to define the colliders for the tiles. So most of these are pretty simple. You can see the, the big wall is just a square, and then these are a rectangle, and then these are sort of a trapezoid. Um, we also have the peg, which if we zoom in on it, is just a little diamond shape. And actually this is something that tripped me up a little bit. When I, when I first started experimenting around with this, here, let me, let me clear this. Um, reset to default, oh no, clear. So when I, when I first started uh, this, I had sort of an octagon shape. Uh, we can click add polygon and then uh, define an octagon like this following sort of the contours of the peg. What I found is that it's very easy if you, if you do it like this for things to fall and rest on the flat top of the octagon. So uh, I decided to change it to just be a diamond. Um, and surprisingly, there are still some cases where it rests on top. So that's something I will probably have to figure out in the long term. But for the most part, uh, in a collisions, the ball will roll off one side or the other. Um, but anyway, so I defined this collision, and the default collision layer is one. So if you have your physics objects, such as this, um, the ball, which I'll show you in a bit, if you just have them also have a mask on collision layer one, you don't really need to do anything else. Um, so that's very simple. But uh, once I have this defined, uh, I can very easily set up the dungeon here by just going to tile map, um, selecting a tile, and then painting. So I have the fill bucket right now, but you can just sort of draw tiles on the map. Um, you can also paint in to fill areas. Uh, it just it makes it very easy to set up the scene. I don't know if I necessarily want to set up the scene in this way for the actual game, but at least for prototyping, being able to paint in the pegs and the walls is very convenient. So once I had the tile set defined, the first class that I needed to implement was a way to drop the ball from the top of the pit. Uh, and I ended up going with this, uh, I'm calling it drop path. So um, the way the scene works is we have, as the root node, a, a path 2D node. Um, underneath it, we have a path follow 2D node, which is a node which can follow a curve defined in a path 2D. And then uh, down here underneath that, we have an animated sprite 2D. Now in the past, uh, what I've done is I've just used sprites and then I've animated them manually with an animation player. Uh, I recently discovered the animated sprite 2D node, which is very convenient if you have an animation that consists only of frames without you know other things moving around. I'll, I'll probably dig into that more in a future video, but uh, for now I'm, I'm experimenting with using animated sprites rather than just regular sprites. Although at the moment it's not animated, it's just a little frame. So let's take a look at the code that I've defined for drop path. Uh, the first thing we have is we have these states, idle tracking and scanning. And tracking and scanning are actually for uh, different modes of the game. I have two demos here. So I, I've already shown you the scanning demo. So in the scanning demo, um, the hero just moves back and forth at the top of the pit. And then when you click, the hero drops uh, and starts falling down the pegs. The tracking version of this um, has a little bit more control to it. Uh, basically, you move the mouse and the hero moves with the mouse along the curve, and then you can click and release, and the hero will uh, fall when you do that, which gives the player a little bit more control over where the hero gets dropped. And the reason that I implemented both of these is mostly indecision. I'm still trying to figure out which one of these modes is better. Uh, a little bit more on that later, but let's just keep looking through the code. Uh, I have a signal here for the ball being dropped. 
um, which actually, now that I think about it, is probably not necessary, so I'm just going to delete that. We have the unit, um, which is referring to a custom class I defined. Right now, the unit just defines the animation frames for when the unit is a ball and when it's a character, which is something I haven't implemented this yet, but when the character enters a room, I'm thinking of changing the animation um, to something a little less spherical. Uh, so this basically contains the data of whatever unit's currently being moved. We have the speed at which it moves back and forth if it's scanning. Um, this stores the state, so if it's idle, there's no character. If it's tracking, then the character's moving according to the mouse. If it's scanning, it's moving back and forth. We have the velocity of the ball, which is important when you release it so that it knows how fast it should be going to start with. Uh, and then these are just on ready vars uh, referring to the children of the drop path scene. I've defined a setter function for unit. Uh, and how, the way that setter function works, uh, if you haven't seen them before, is that whenever I set the value unit, it's going to call this setter function. Um, and what the setter function does is it sets the property unit to be equal to whatever value you want, um, which is what normally happens when you set the value. But it will also go into the animated sprite. Um, so that's this node right here, animated sprite 2D. And it'll change the sprite frames to match whatever is stored in the unit. I remember I'm using unit to store data about the hero. It, so for example, when it, you call the function add unit, it's going to set unit to whatever the value is that you pass it. But in addition, it's going to call this set unit function. Uh, and the syntax for that is just you have your variable and then you do a colon and then set equals whatever the function is. Uh, then I have set state. Uh, this is a similar thing. Whenever you modify the state variable, it's going to call this setter function. And the important thing that happens here is if you're setting the state to be idle, it's going to turn off physics processing. Whereas if you set it to tracking or scanning, it's going to turn physics processing on. And uh, this is important because uh, physics process is a built-in function that's called every physics frame. Delta is how long it's been since the last physics frame. And if physics process is off, it's not going to run any of this code. Uh, so when you're in the idle state, it will ignore this code. If you're in the tracking or scanning state, uh, depending on which state you're in, it will either uh, track the mouse position um, or it will have the hero at the, at the top of the screen move back and forth uh, so that you can click on it when you want it to drop. And this is also where I compute the velocity based on how far the hero has moved since the last physics frame. We have a ready, which is called when uh, you enter the scene, and this just sets physics processing to false so that by default it's not going to be processing physics at all. Um, we have a couple utility functions here to get the ball position and the ball velocity, and a uh, function to get the closest point on the curve, which is useful for tracking to decide where the hero should be on the curve when we're about to uh, drop it into the pit. Um, and then just some other utility functions uh, to add a new unit, to change the state to tracking or scanning, and to clear the unit. Now, I am a big believer in unit testing and test-driven development. The, the first thing I do now when I start up any project is to install GDUnit4, uh, and this is no exception. So I did create a drop path test, and I ran into some difficulties here. Um, this is testing the get ball velocity. Um, so if you remember, we have uh, the velocity of the ball is being set during the physics process based on how fast it's moving. My ball velocity tests creates a scene runner from drop path, and it defines a curve, um, which is just a series of points between 0, 0, and 1,000, 0. Uh, so this is the path that the hero at the top of the screen is going to move along. It has a move speed of 500. So when you're using a runner, um, you don't call functions directly. Instead, you use runner.setProperty or .invoke. There, there's more details on the GDUnit4 site, and I might make more GDUnit4 tutorials in the future. But I'm asserting that uh, when the ball is moving to the right, we expect the velocity to be uh, 500, and then when we're moving, it's moving to the left, we expect it to be negative 500 in the x direction. It's not exactly equal because when we simulate frames, the amount of time between successive frames 
uh, is not always exactly the same. So this is an approximation, and we can we can run this test, uh, and you can see that it passes, which is good. I also tried to make a test for the uh, get ball position. It it didn't work in the sense that because of the differences in the frame simulation, I wasn't able to get a reliable result. Uh, so I still haven't figured out. Uh, oh, uh, and get property list. Okay, there's. There's an error in this test that I didn't notice before. I'm not going to deal with that right now. But the important thing is to create tests and use those to verify that your functionality is working properly. So let's jump over to the ball class. It is very simple. Uh, the ball class basically consists of a rigid body 2D, uh, a sprite representing the character, and a collision shape, which is a circle of radius 10 pixels. If we go and look in the script for ball, uh, all it has is it contains data on the unit, and this is again linked with a setter function, which sets the unit, but then also uh, sets the, f the uh, sprite frames for the animated sprite to be equal to uh, whatever the data in the unit suggests. Remember, data contains information about the animation that should be used for the ball and the animation that should be used for the character. The thing I like about using a rigid body 2D is that basically it takes care of most of the work for us. It already has gravity built into it, so all we have to do is create it and let it fall, and then when it collides with something, we would trigger some function. So this is a very simple way to make characters to fall into the pit. Another neat thing is uh, if you look in units, um, you can see I have the script for unit, which is very simple. It's just a data container. But then I also created a specific uh, priest unit. I can then define the frames uh, over here in the editor. And I could just create a separate unit for each of the characters. So for example, if I want to create, say, um, I can say create unit uh, of this type, call it, I don't know, um, warrior. I don't actually have an animation for it yet, but if I then click on it here, um, you can see ball frames is empty. I can just drag this, uh, which would be the presumably the warrior animation over here, and that's it. Now I can use this uh, as data when I'm generating characters. So the resource system makes it very easy to define templates and then use them to just create a bunch of uh, data that your other classes can read. So that's most of what I've accomplished so far in terms of implementation. The only other thing uh, I want to talk about is a couple of difficulties. So one difficulty that I've had so far is that when running this, uh, the heroes tend, when they enter the pegs, to keep going in a particular direction. Um, so for example, here you can see it, oh, well, okay, that one changed direction. Okay, well, I, I say this was a difficulty and now it's not happening anymore. So. Uh, maybe I'm worried about this for nothing. But um, one thing I was observing was characters just going down uh, in a straight line, and then that's a little bit too predictable. I, I may need to work out the physics of that. Uh, it's affected by the spacing of pegs, the size of the balls, and the gravity constant. Um, one solution is probably just to use an irregular peg spacing, like is done in Peglin, so that it's less predictable where the hero will, will fall. Uh, the other thing is just trying to figure out which method of dropping is going to be the hero is going to be better, uh, scanning versus tracking the mouse. So scanning, of course, goes back and forth. You click and then it drops um, versus the alternative is the player manually deciding where to drop the hero. Um, so this is manually choosing the drop point. Scanning is nice because the controls are easier. You just do a one button click and it's based on timing rather than positioning. But I am a little bit worried about uh, player agency because, of course, a game like this is already going to have a lot of randomness. The player wants to be in control of some things. And the, the question is, is dropping the hero based on timing uh, depriving them of too much agency uh, as opposed to dropping the hero where you want to? So that's something I need to figure out. But that's pretty much where I am uh, for now in the game. I would say that the next big thing I need to figure out is the room system, uh, just having rooms that are linked with the main board and having a dungeon core where adventurers can fight. So thank you for listening uh, to this devlog. Hopefully it gave you something useful that you can apply in your own projects, and I'll try to post more of these.